to turn my mic on folks it's been a while welcome to the catholic underground which is your weekly catholic guide to the digital continent i'm father chris decker here in beautiful baton rouge louisiana um that's uh, where we're coming to you from our studios at the catholic radio studios here in baton rouge we've also got father ryan humphreys joining us from campy louisiana in his uh, brand spanking new rectory in fact uh, what i'll do for those of you who are watching on the video feed is i'll I'll put this up full screen so you can how beautiful, beautiful his rectory is. Hello, Father. Hello, world. It's a, it's a whole new kind of thing. There are no squirrels or possums above me. There, <laughs> there are no stray dogs below me, and there are no termites at all in my proximity. It's, it's a whole new experience. But, uh, but thanks be to God, this rectory got finished. It's a real gift. He's just got an ellipse there above, uh, below his chin, I should say. As an ellipse below my chin. I don't know what that means. That's right. It's your, your pop filter. Oh yes, yes. It's it's happiness and joy, and keeps me from sounding like I'm squeezing my s's. So like, so behind you there, just to take a, a small little tour behind you there is on the other side. Is that the hallway to your kitchen? Yes, that that. Oh, that's the other side. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, that takes you uh, out to the kitchen slash living room slash dining room zone. It's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then where my finger is, that's actually a window, and you're looking out the back of the house. Oh. Okay. And uh, so there's nice two nice guest rooms. Uh, one of them is Father Chris compatible. We have uh, ordered amenities, so you know there are campy specialized, uh, you know, uh, bath salts and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we're we're looking to get us uh, some leather club chairs in this week, and so that the house is coming together. And uh, my parents are looking to donate a few more things, and then uh, we'll be we'll be done. It's not fancy; it's very very down to earth, but it's uh, it's nice, and it's going to last us for a long time. And so uh, everything is great. And now all we need to do is uh, you know stop and take a breath. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's what the plan is for this week. Well, very cool. Well, uh, yeah, I look forward to visiting you up there. And, of course, all of you uh, in podcast land have now virtually visited Father Ryan's rectory. Maybe there'll be a tour someday um, if we, you know, actually get off our you-know-what and do that with an iPhone. We probably won't. Well, <laughs> you'll notice that Josh isn't here. Josh is out this evening, but we'll still try and have fun without him, even though he's usually the life of the party. Um, of course, there should be a party because it's GIF's birthday. Yeah. Dot GIF on June 15th turned 25 years old it's hard to believe that the gif is that old in fact it doesn't well except for the the little jagglies around it doesn't look a day above 12 so <laughs> transparent gifts always look um look a lot older. yeah they just don't look good yeah. that's right so now now father ryan I, I i know very much uh, about gifts in fact i rarely use them anymore because i think Thank that you. they've been they've been eclipsed by other technologies um but gif pretty much had had two early jobs to do yeah you gif on the web or, or gif on the web they had two jobs one was transparency and that was actually fairly useful and then the other one was animation which was terrifying we can thank dot gif for a million annoying rotating envelopes <laughs> running dogs blinking lines swirling circles and other things that make you want to pull your hair out throw it on the ground and scream Ah, like that. <laughs> what about uh, what about the the animated gift that was like the little rainbow uh, horizontal rule? Oh yeah, I think and it just everybody kept had one of those. Yeah. Oh, and it did. It just went and and it just went on and on and on. And then some people really bad would put two or three of them to make right. sure it went across the entire giant page. And so <laughs> you know, on your dial up modem, you know, at fourteen hundred baud, you could right. expect to wait an extra four minutes for that page to load. Just so you could see that lovely animated <laughs> gift. <laughs> yep, that that's true. Now, now the GIF has been has been it served its purpose well. In fact, it's kind of coming back. You know, uh, I don't know if um, if you watch on, on Pinterest or anything like that. Is animated GIFs are what people will use to to kind of uh, take movie clips and string them together, or right. to make those rotating avatars, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, people have learned a, a sense of uh, of restraint, and so GIF has its place. I mean, you know, like alpha channels. For, for pings, if you want to do transparency, you don't do it with GIF anymore. You do it with pings right. because they do a way better job in a lot less less uh, space. And if you want to do animations nowadays, that's typically Flash. And, of course, 
uh, gurus like Father Chris can use CSS and HTML, but uh, HTML5. But 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 GIF it, it still has a place, and like a lot of stuff, it was just grossly abused for a long time, and now that it's not being grossly abused, we can appreciate it and make use of it again. That's right. And in fact, I'm I'm rather amazed when I see a tum blog that actually is animating something and go, gee, is that is that some sort of a a flash animation? Nope, just good old GIF because it's still a small file size generally. Yeah, comparatively. And of course, there's a lot of people who don't want to have Flash. I mean, I have every piece of equipment I own has something that prevents Flash from running on it, including my PC, uh, because I hate Flash. It crashes computers. And so uh, if yeah. you, some stuff you really do need to look to, to ping, I mean, to gift for. And have you noticed that, uh, that, that Chrome is crashing an awful lot more with Flash? Yeah, well, I, I've, I've, the only time I even consider Flash is with, uh, in YouTube. Everything else... It doesn't matter what it is. It just doesn't. It doesn't <laughs> you just don't. Out. You just don't use it. No, I mean, I got a a, a, a new plugin called Media Browser mm -hmm. or Media Filter or Media something. Anyway, it kills everything. Anyway, you just run and it kills everything. <laughs> uh, and so it's it's incredibly helpful for me because that means I don't ever see anything with Flash in any of my uh, web pages. Oh, ever. Well, that's interesting. I'll have to to look into that. But anyway, Happy Birthday dot GIF or dot GIF, I think, is what they originally wanted to call it. That was um, crazy. People. Yeah, that's yeah. peanut. Butter. That's that's a whole nother um, sticky situation there <laughs> uh, or creamy, uh, as the case may be. All yeah. right. Uh, yeah, we've all used it. We've all used the gift. So happy birthday, gift. And uh, may may you continue to reign uh, in moderation. Now, there you go. That's right. Uh, all, like St. Benedict says about gifts, <laughs> all things in <laughs> all file formats in moderation. <laughs> There's a the title of the episode right there. Could be. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so one of the things that you can probably use uh, on your, your new MacBook Pro is is a, a GIF browser, but a new set of MacBooks came out. Now, Father, I have to admit, you were you were overseas. You, you're fresh back yeah, from was, Europe. I was actually following this from the uh, the cruise ship. Really? Um, at a, I forget the time, but it was an odd time, and I was following it when we were in, not the cruise ship, but we were back in Rome at that point. We were already off, off the cruise ship and, and staying in Rome for a couple of days. And uh, I followed this from there over 3G, and I didn't watch the thing, obviously, but I read a couple of live blogs. And uh, it's, it's basically um, something that's going to matter in a year. This is what the MacBook Air was originally. The MacBook Air was about three years ahead of Ultrabooks, mm -hmm. and now it's, it's become a standard. This, uh, what they're calling the, the retina display, although it's not a truly retina display, is gigantic it's gorgeous it's amazing it's going to be the future um these macbook pros they've just released have fewer ports they're almost entirely not upgradable you can't even replace the battery you know, really you go in the, and the battery is glued to other parts and so anything on the inside of the sucker has got to go to a, a licensed mac uh, a hardware specialist um it's it's completely not upgradable but it's a beautiful computer uh, and it is unquestionably the future of where Mac is going to be, uh, but it's going to be that way in about two years. I, I don't think there's anybody right now who really has to have this high-end MacBook Pro. You give it two years, all of them will have the so-called Retina display in it, mm -hmm. and uh, and you'll you'll be sitting in, in butter. Which is, which, is of where, which is where you want to be sitting if you're using a computer. Yeah. It doesn't conduct as much. <laughs> That's right. So So you say it's not a true Retina display. Uh, no. Uh, well, and that's because um, with the iPhone, the, the intention is that you're looking at the iPhone from just a few inches away from your face, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe two feet at most. And so a retina display then is calculated by the number of pixels, the distance from your eye, and you, you do the math, and that tells you exactly how, um, how many pixels you need to have something that cannot be, that the eye can't tell the difference, so to speak. Um, the, the new iPad, the iPad 3, um, does have a retina display if you're holding it within, again, within the length of your arm. However, a laptop, especially a larger screen, you know, you can, you can very, very considerably plan to look at that from some distance away, you know, and then it, you ask the question, well, is that a real retina display? It's extremely high res. It's extremely high quality. No one should say it's bad because it's not retina, but I think there's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. there, there's more to come down the road. Right. Charging six, $800 for this one feature, right. you know, it seems like a lot. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, and there's, there's a lot of stuff on the web to read one way or the other. That's just my opinion. So. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I'm, as I'm, I'm, as you're talking, I'm holding my iPhone 4S up to my, my face. I've never really thought about it before, but yeah, the, the closer you hold it to your face, the more you can begin to pick out pixels. 
Right. You know, but but obviously, if you're holding it in normal distance, your eye only discerns a clean line. And so so you, you're never going to find a retina display that you can't hold up into your eyeball and you know, <laughs> and tell at least a little bit of the pixelation. It's kind of like those infomercials that offer you HD sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to laugh. I'm like, well, the eyeball is HD. Otherwise, seeing HD would mean nothing to yeah. you. <laughs> as long as you're 2020, you're already seeing an HD. That's right. Otherwise, it's all sticks. Some people chill. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I think the, the the long and the short of this particular message is this thing is worth following. This is where the MacBook is going to go. But unless you really have something you particularly need, mm -hmm. um, it's not worth spending the money right now. Yeah. Now, another thing that's kind of an ancillary point is that, fi is that FireWire is going the way of the Dodo. Which um, is sad because, I mean, the camera that, yeah. that you're looking at right now um, that, that I'm coming to you on is a FireWire camera. Yeah, and, and apparently, I mean, Apple brought it into existence, and apparently, it's taking it out now. Well, I think that Thunderbolt is they're trying to, you know, replace it. And of course, Apple has never had any time for holding on to legacy stuff. Right. Uh, but I have a lot of FireWire. In fact, my Drobo is FireWire right now, and uh -huh. it, it's where I store everything. And um, you know, of course, there's no danger of losing FireWire on the iMac, which is supposed to be updated within the next year. But uh. But the MacBook Pros, they're really starting to get more and more concerned about fewer and fewer ports. Yeah. In fact, they've even put a proprietary uh, power supply on there um, that you have to use an adapter if you want to use an, another, an old, older version really? of the, the MagLock power, power supply. Yeah, it's, hmm. it, it's kind of this compulsive, Jobsian thing, but, you know, it's they, what we expect from Apple. They really want you inside their, their walled garden. If you, if you. Yes, they do. <laughs> That's right. So we move from one walled garden into into a garden where everybody has public access. Yes. And and that's uh the new Microsoft Surface. <laughs> one day your computer will be a giant table. <laughs> a huge drafting table where you can have supper and find out how much how many calories are in the bacon you're eating. You know what I think about when I think about the the big table Microsoft Surface is whenever you'd go to Pizza Hut and you'd always try and scramble <laughs> to play Pac-Man on that big acrylic table. <laughs> Yes. You know which I one I'm talking that. about. Oh, yes. I remember that very well. So Microsoft is is bringing this into uh, a 2012 version of reality by putting it um, on, on a tablet or just about anything else. This was a super secret announcement. Right. They they tried to make the, some kind of Apple-esque moment, and everybody showed up, and then they were they were announcing a prototype, not a working version, not something anybody could hold and play with, a prototype. They have no idea how much it's going to cost. They have no idea... Uh, you know exactly what the specs are going to be, so it was fairly stupid in my mind to bring <laughs> everybody there and go, wait, wait, wait. We know that Google's going to announce something next week, but we've got something here. And but you can just see Balmer upstage of sweating and going, I don't even know why we're doing this. Why? Why am I here? <laughs> I'm a little um, confused. I'm not going to lie. But <laughs> but the uh, the the new tablet, which which I think is an extension of, as you say, their goofy Surface technology, uh, looks to actually like it could be a real competitor. Now they're trying to brand it as an iPad killer, which is dumb on so many levels. You don't want to do that um, with, with something that's not even for sale yet. If it's a concept yeah. piece, well. Right. No, I mean, it, it's going to have all the stuff that people want, right? It's going to have your standard Android tablet stuff, multi-touch, SD card, USB ports. They they have a cool case that has a built-in keyboard. You know, that that's great. Every You can get all that stuff for every tablet out there. The question is going to be whether Microsoft's uh, Windows 8 tablet version, what they're calling the Metro interface, mm -hmm. is really going to have all the magic it's supposed to have. And if it does, then I'll find myself wanting to pick up one of these things. And if it doesn't, then no one's going to care about it any more than they care about the playbook or any other nonsense that had great specs and then turned into a big giant pile of rubbish. So it has the capability, at least if, if the kernel and everything works, to really be um, not so much a game changer as, as kind of a, a, a deepening in your use of, of, uh, of mobile technology. Yeah, it, it's, it's I mean, a paradigm changing. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, th there's a lot of people, I think myself included, you take your iPad with you, and that's the only computer I took on this month-long vacation was my iPad. Um, and there were a handful of times where all I needed was five minutes on a real computer interface. Right. You know, and that's it. I, I didn't need to, to change the world. I just needed five minutes with a couple windows, moving them around, cutting and pasting, stuff like that. And what Microsoft offers is basically you have the Metro interface, which is their, their kind of tiles sort of interface, which looks very good. Um, and then you can, if you need to, you can switch into a full-on operating system kernel. Oh, nice. You know, with your... Yeah you know, all your windows and all that kind of stuff. Now, it eats up a lot more battery, but you can do it. 
And then you can kick back out of that when you don't need to into the tablet versions of all the software you're using. And so that's a paradigm change. That's a brilliant idea. And if it works as it's worked on prototypes, then it will be mind bending. But if it doesn't, it'll be a giant waste of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like Android. Android promises an awful lot, but, uh, but a lot of times it doesn't really do anything. So, uh, so we'll see. Um, uh, probably the most important statistic missing from the, the announcement was the battery life. No matter how much the thing costs, if it can't compare to that nine or ten hours of all day battery, right? You know, there's no real point even considering it. Yeah, that's that stuff under the hood that Apple really has been appropriately obsessive about, and it served them very well. Um, it yeah, served them really yeah. well. But but I mean, if if you you know, it's kind of like in the in the '90s and the late '80s where you're you've got a phone to your ear, but uh, the rest of it's connected to your hip. And then that's connected to a giant battery pack that's twenty <laughs> feet on a back. dolly being carried by by a child and a vimp, you know. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So so that of course is going to be the big thing. But I love the idea of being able to peel back the mobile and going into the operating system if I need to. That to me that's me very important. Like for example, with graphic design and things like that, we were talking about it before the show. You asked why I didn't have uh, one of the the Apple Touch Pads. You know the little. Um, the little surface. Oh, I can't use that word now. Trackpad. The little trackpad. Track there we go. Um, <laughs> in, instead of my wireless mouse uh, that has batteries that are running low, and and I said, well, it was because some applications that would be great for me, but some of the things that I do, uh, I actually need to to kind of to 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 hold the mouse in a certain way to get the the icon manipulated or whatever a certain way. I I, I would love to be able to just uh, you know pull back the mobile operating system, use my finger or something like that. I, I really think there there could be something to this, and and I I hate to say it, but but Windows may actually be getting some people back. What do you think if this if this does everything it's supposed to? No, if it does, I mean I think I think Windows can make a real uh, a real play to the tablet market and and to the business market as well. But uh, you know, I, it, it's something that that's going to be very difficult because you know the, the iPad mentality is you know it's not a real computer, it's not a full computer. Yeah. And you just have to learn to do a limited number of things with it. If Microsoft can change that and say, no, no, the tablet should be, you know, somewhere between a laptop and a tab and, and the iPad, then that, they can get some real business there. Well, I'm excited to see uh, to see what that does, and and hopefully it moves past the uh, the stage of, well, wouldn't this be nice? We're going to show it to you as if it were real, you know. Yeah, and Balmer's put a lot of flop sweat into this, and it's important that we have some time to look. At <laughs> that's right. You want to make sure that uh, that that's what's happening. Yeah. Well, well, we move from uh, from <laughs> from flop sweat <laughs> into just idea. into just plain old fun. Now, now, Father Ryan, uh, I don't know if you watched this on PBS whenever um, you were an urchin. Uh, I watched it to some degree. Um, it was Reading Rainbow. It was very popular. Uh, it was where a lot of kids encountered their first books. That's right. Oh, yeah, I loved it. I loved me some of our Burton. I wondered, uh, after I started watching Star Trek, it was odd. I didn't know why he didn't have his glasses on there. And it, it was. And you know, was that, that, that's the one thing I remember um, from, uh, from, from whenever I finally became a fan of Star Trek is, uh, is I said to myself one day, hey, wait a minute, that's that guy. The dude, with that's the thing right. On the face. What's he doing outside of the Star Trek <laughs> universe? And and that's actually I didn't discover reading Rainbow until well after Mister <laughs> Rogers. So I mean I was I was a little on the uh, on the side of uh, I don't know sheltered child or whatever. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we were we were just uh, watching a little bit of Lavar Burton on reading Rainbow, talking about Star Trek. In fact, that is what Doc Brown was uh, talking about when he spoke <laughs> of a paradox and how dangerous that's it right. could be. You know, so <laughs> you're not thinking fourth dimensionally. That's right, and we skewed into this tangent. So <laughs> apparently, <laughs> reading Rainbow is is resurrecting. It's resurrecting yeah, to not, something new, not as a TV show, right. not a not and, as it was. It and was this is a key. public funded TV. Yeah, this but, is the key thing. It, it's a, it's transforming into an, an iPad app that brings together the text, an audio read version video and animations all together this is this is maddening it's crazy and it just might work <laughs> <laughs> back to 90s sci-fi again <laughs> that's right uh well, the, the fact that that uh, it's taking something that that we know that that works that kids love i mean how many how many kids uh jostle for their parents iphone and their ipad because the interface is so simple 
and uh, and Lavar, you're on top of things. You said, why don't I just uh, do this again? You know, I think that's great. Yeah. No, I do too. I mean, well, Lavar Burton is a regular guest on Twit mm-hmm. and uh, on a, on a lot of higher end kind of um, you know tech stuff. He he's a really savvy tech guy, and he also produces a lot of video. and And just like the old show. He's going to read some of the books, and uh, a special guest star will read some of the books. Um, like Brent and Spiner, be... who I think needs some work these days. <laughs> <laughs> he really does. Uh, they gave him a big arc on Big Bang Theory. But anyway, oh. um, yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fairly gigantic moment because we've been waiting for the iPad to, to really come alive with education for kids. And, you know, there's things where you move the, the, the numeral one to where there's one apple and you move the numeral three to where there's three pairs. But this becomes a really a kind of thing where you can actually put it in front of a kid and say, you're going to learn how to read, mm-hmm. you know. And, of course, mommy and daddy should be there. And, of course, the teachers have a place. But this becomes a reasonable way for us, a fairly young child, to learn how to read at a fairly high level. Yeah. Um, and that's the first time that technology has really offered that to us in a compelling way. And and I, I can't wait to see what it begins to do for adult reading, you know. I for, think it could be very useful. Yeah. And, and, and by that, I mean, of course, uh, I just think of like theology texts coming alive and mm-hmm. um, just really everything that that the iBook suite, I think, is, is trying to kind of nudge us toward. Um, but but a really interactive learning experience, because I think uh, it's no surprise that that all of us are kind of growing shorter in the intention span department. And so whenever you're reading something on the iPad, you almost have to encounter it. It's true. You know, especially if it's nonfiction, I guess. Fiction, yeah, I mean, and, oh, you know, is a little bit, I was going to say fiction, I can enter into the universe a little bit better. But if it's nonfiction, you sometimes need some extra little pointers here and there, a, a timeline or an image or something to kind of jog it into your mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the framework itself, you know, aside from the reading rainbow application, the framework becomes extremely interesting. You know, I mean, I could even see the camera on top of your iPad becoming very useful as it tracks your eyes. Sure, like you know, you mean and up and down look. the page. That's right. And, well, I mean, I could even see something like you know, you you're reading something and you've read the same line six times, and the book knows. It seems like you're having a bit of a trouble with this, and you know, not Clippy yeah. from Microsoft popping up, but no. you could see just something popping down from the top saying. You know, are you having trouble understanding this, or do you want to highlight this, or do you want to ask a question about this? Um, you know, and you as this like translate into Dutch, more sophisticated, you know, you really could see those kind of things becoming useful and valuable tools. Yeah, uh, that's you know, highlighting with your eyes—that's a cool idea. Mm, it's spooky almost. <laughs> it's magical <laughs> to allow the camera that much control over my eyeball. Oh wait, no, it'd be the other way around. Sorry, that's that's Skynet. I'm thinking of again. <laughs> yeah, you'd be you'd be going all Superman on it. Uh. That's right. So now this thing isn't quite ready yet. It's still cooking, right? And it, it it's not going to be free. This is going to be a service. I believe it's like nine ninety nine a month. So or, kind of like the daily year. for kids. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's going to be. It's not going to be something everybody's going to just jump into. It's going to be a limited number of people. But uh, Lavar Burton is is brilliant, and I, I've I've uh, I'm very excited about about him working with this. You know, and I'm very tempted to get a month or two service just to see what it's like, mm-hmm. uh, because I could definitely see both of my nephews who are just the right age. You know, both of my nephews are right at two years old, and uh, in about three or four years, when this has really got itself together, yeah. you know, they're they're start to get into a situation where that might be something I'd pay for for them. Right, and that that that's a beautiful thing too. Um, you could gift that subscription and that sort of thing. Of course, we're going to have to get your uh, your brother in law there to to move away from the Arcos tablet or whatever. Well, we we gave my uh my mom and I gave my sister an iPad into that house, and uh, and my little nephew who is twenty months old, every time he goes anywhere, he wants to play with a phone, and he he reaches out and he knows how to slide to unlock, uh-huh. and he knows which apps he likes, you know, and he'll play with them. And I, I mean, my, I can hand him a, an iPad that's off. Mm-hmm. He can turn it on, slide to unlock. And load an app, and he's twenty months old. He's not wow. even two. He's not even talking yet. Yeah, and and he's doing that. It's pretty he'll, insane. He'll be jacked into the mine core in no time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine so. <laughs> You're listening to the World Core Computer Network in your head. <laughs> it's so scary to think that he's only twenty months old. Ah, that's right. Well, that was about the age Neo was when he discovered. No, that's that's about right. Anyway, so uh, we move uh, no. from all of this. This. Whoa. <laughs> This uh, this techno wonder to uh, well to the the world of faith and techno wonder 
Um, the digital mafia, uh, I mean, I can, or you can, no, I can. The people who do internet domains, um, they, they want to improve the internet or make money. We're, we're not sure which. Um, but they kind of opened up the, the arena for a series of top-level domains. So that would be like .com or .net. And uh, a number of broadcast networks have applied for them, like .nbc, .cbs, .bbc. Well, there's another curious one that, that came across um, our, our feeds, and that is the .catholic extension. And uh, this is actually be pretty cool. Um, so the idea is that the Vatican would control this domain, this top-level domain. And uh, I'm just trying to think in my head about uh, how Italians running a top-level domain <laughs> is going to go. You yeah, know? The application process would take six years. That's right. And, and so basically, um, if, you're, if you are Catholic and if you are, in a sense, vetted by the Holy See, you would then be given this domain name. So, uh, for example, not that it would ever happen to us, <laughs> catholicunderground.catholic would be the way to know, know they're, they're loyal, they're orthodox, and uh, they're, they're worthy of, uh, of your attention. So, I mean, what, what, what do you think about it, Father? I mean, is this something that, that you would want to have, like fatherryan.catholic? Well, I, I don't know I'd want a vanity domain, but I would certainly, you know, it would certainly be for me a safe way, like a nihil obstat yeah. of knowing uh, or an imprimatur of, of knowing who's good and who's not. If I, like Catholic.org, I know is good, but true Catholic.org is full of crazy people. Right. Um, you know, and, and there's not any compelling way right now to know the difference. For me, I would love to know that that, that vetted domain is out there. I don't know what I'd have to go through to get one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I could see it would become extremely confusing very quickly if it was nativitycatholicchurch.catholic or nativitycanty.catholic. It becomes really tough. Yeah, it's actually a pretty long, parishes. it's a long domain. Yeah, it would be. Dot but, Catholic. Uh, and, I, and I don't know, frankly, that little simple vanity domains, because I imagine these would not be your $20 a year deals. I imagine they'd right. be. Yeah, that, that's you know, what I was reading is that it would be for uh, officially sanctioned um, Vatican websites and those uh, kind of, I guess, extensions of the apostolates of the yeah. various dicasteries and things like that. Yeah. At least that and seems I mean, I could also be, see dioceses having, sure. you know. But, yeah. I mean, but each one of these suckers, just the application costs you $185,000 to make. You know, and 2,000 separate people made requests. Right. Uh, you know, give or take. So, I mean, it. who knows? But, I mean... Uh, it, it's yeah, it, it's not going to be cheap either way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. Again, as you say, Father, that's that's what my thinking is, is that it will be kind of the imprimatur that you can go to this site and you don't have to worry. Of course, it raises the bigger question too: is now who's going to watch this? You know, yeah. say, um, you know, say, uh, you know, Catholics. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to think of something that is extremely orthodox, right? Uh, the priestly fraternity of Saint Peter dot Catholic, right? Well, well, what's to say that uh, a, a, a rather crazy person takes over the website and then starts, you know, putting um, things that are heterodox on it? Well, then who would watch that? Who would who would vet that? You know, yeah. that, that kind of opens up this whole new, um, I, I guess, appropriate in some ways, a watchdog agency. Would that be the CDF? Would it be would they, you know, have Father Ryan come and sit in an office and just surf dot Catholic domains all day? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard to say, I mean, because, you know, .gov is supposed to be a limited domain. Yeah. But we know very well that, that federal, state, and local people have crazy stuff on .gov, yeah. you know, addresses. So, you know, it, it, you'd have to wonder whether the Vatican would watchdog it or, or whether the only vetting would be at the front or mm-hmm. whether, you know, every time they came up for a renewal, you know, every yeah. five or six years, whether they'd do a surf of the website and make sure, you know, mm-hmm. it's hard to say. And nothing else provide paperwork and necessary Oh, yeah. As long as you pay Toxa, you can get anything in the room. (laughs) That's exactly right. Anything in the room. (laughs) Yeah. You want want to be a cardinal? Tax is very, very high. So so, uh, Vatican picked up the .catholic uh, top-level domain, and the Vatican has also picked up an American news person. That's actually pretty big news, too. Uh, The the, uh, Fox News man, um, Greg Burke, was the Fox correspondent in Rome, and he actually had just finished his uh, application for dual citizenship in, in Italy and the United States. And uh, he actually, he, he, was, he was picked up by the Vatican, and he is now going to work in the Holy See to, uh, to quote, improve and coordinate the Vatican's various communications operations, unquote. Uh, I, I think this could be a very good thing. 
um, you know, the, the, the Vatican is, is very good at, um, at promoting from the inside. And right. a lot of the various dicasteries have a lot of the of, of Italian men that, that are that are qualified, um, and then some of them they open. I'm thinking of the social communications uh, secretariat that uh, that mm-hmm. has people from all over the world. But to have a guy who's not a cleric, to to have somebody who who presumably is is more than nominally Catholic, uh, who mm-hmm. is actually a journalist in the field, I, I'm getting some some little hints. That this could be one of those things of ah, this might have been what the Second Vatican Council was talking about, <laughs> you know, on getting on. We really know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah the g- getting getting actual professionals who have been trained and who have or who are outstanding in some way in that field, um, to to begin to speak from their perspective on uh, on something that is important to the church's ability to communicate the gospel. I think this could be a very good thing. Well, yeah, and, and you know, the Vatican's been doing this in a lot of other dicasteries. Yeah. You know, for 20 years, we've had experts in migrants. We've had experts in, in all kinds of matters. Astrophysics and astronomy. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've got mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff. And, and for no apparent reason, uh, the Vatican has been very slow to have anybody in a cohesive sense running their communication. I mean, we've had, you know, you know the, the uh, was it Joachim Navarro Falls that John Paul II had as his, his primary, you know, liaison to the media. He was but also a soap opera. Yeah, and, and there's some there's some very smart people at radio uh, or at Vatican Radio. Yeah. Some very smart people at at is it CTV? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but but there's not been a cohesive, structured yeah. plan for communication. Right. You know, and now there's a whole separate office for new evangelization that doesn't seem to be talking about new media very much at all. Uh, and this becomes a really really good decision. I hope sincerely that they put a lot of stock in this man's words because you know. More and more and more, the church needs a cohesive sense of communication. Yeah, not just to release news pre- press releases, but but to have a I mean, a, a, just a cohesive plan. Yeah, you know, how are we going to use the radio to catechize, and what role does that have in connection with Twitter? And and right now, it's pretty haphazard, and yeah. it would be really good to have some some cohesion. Very cool. Yeah, I look forward to that as well. Uh, in fact, I was I was following the story on another website that I read, and I was uh, quite excited to see that that he was uh, he was taken if you will by uh, by the holy <laughs> see because uh, it's good again to have people that are doing the job they're doing the work and they're in the world but they're hoping not to be of it uh because their faith is stronger so so uh kudos to you greg burke we'll be watching your career with great interest uh, <laughs> how creepy <of> <laughs> that's right. i'm uh yeah that's exactly i've had fondue that's why i'm being creepy uh catholics now also um are stealing themselves up and they're becoming courageous over the fundamental right, the fundamental right um, to to freedom, and and that's the thing uh, we we are running into. I did I was reading a statistic the other day that about seventy percent of the world um, presently has governments that are in some way hostile to the free practice of religion. And yeah, about right. and and the great experiment, uh, American democracy. It's only what two hundred and thirty five years old, something like that. Um, we we've been we've been religiously free, free to practice since our inception, and here in two thousand and twelve, um, we're beginning to find some very very distinct battle lines drawn, and uh, and the Holy Father, um, who who has who has mentioned it. Um, just in a generic sense about the importance to practice freedom of religion, as well as the United States bishops, who are very specifically mentioning the health and human services mandate, um, have uh, have called, the U.S. bishops have called for a fortnight for freedom. I just like the idea we're using fortnight again. Yeah, me too. <laughs> ever, ever since we, we came over on the boat from England, I don't think we've used that word. So How many fathoms were under that boat, Father? <laughs> at least 60,000 seems like a lot it does doesn't it <laughs> take it up with Jacques Cousteau and Jules Verne <laughs> I don't speak to French people um, <laughs> on principle also Jacques Cousteau is dead we'll um, try and get him anyway yeah I don't think that's a good idea yeah I, I, this is this is one of those things that um you know Americans have sat for the last 40 years yeah and uh and, and have have really done next to nothing every time um, you know, the Catholic faith has been slowly ushered out of the, the public sphere. Yep. And, uh, you know, we've, we've sat by and, and done next to nothing while um, we've allowed really insidious ideas to become very common. The idea of suing someone for offending me, suing someone for upsetting me, 
um, the idea of the court saying, no, 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 you know, common sense has to be put aside in favor of preventing hurting someone's feelings. Yeah. You know, and the logical consequence of that is that at some point you say, well, if your church is preaching something that I find offensive, even if I don't go to your church, right. then somehow or another you owe me some type of retribution. Yeah. You know, and and we've we've really sat by and done nothing for the last 40 years, you know, and uh, and I'm thankful to God that the U.S. bishops have have stepped up and have done some good things, um, you know, but at the same time, I think there is a, there's a, 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 a certain amount of, of uh, blame that we need to take. And also, you know, we don't need to see this, even if it is a win, and we hope and pray that it is a win and that the, that decision is struck down, we don't need to see this as a kind of win that allows us then to sit back on our laurels and enjoy it. No, that's you know, exactly we've right. got, we've got a lot of culture to recover. Yeah. And this is, is a very, very small first step Mm -hmm. uh, in running a marathon. And it's something that we need to think about that way because there are going to be victories and there are going to be losses. And this matters. It matters a lot, but, uh, but we're fools if we think that, that this is coming out of the blue right. or, and we're fools if we think that even if we do win this fight, it's the only fight we're going to have in the next few years. That's right. Every weed was planted next to the wheat. Yeah. You know, um, wh whether it was intentionally sown or whether it just blew into the field, and, and that's, that's the thing, is, is if the weed isn't pulled up um, right as it, as it begins to take root, well, then it begins to grow alongside the wheat, you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we, we have done a, a great deal um, to allow that to happen. Um, yeah. and, and as you say, I think this, uh, the Health and Human Services mandate that, that uh, will require all institutions, uh, religious institutions included, to provide for abortifacient medications and, and drugs that, can, uh, that contracept and things like that, that's just the tip of the iceberg, and in a sense, it's just a presenting issue for something that's even right. deeper. And and um, the fact that we're standing up for freedom, not just for this mandate thing, but to say that we, we are Catholic, we are Christian, we believe in Jesus Christ, and like St. Thomas More, we believe that the law of God is greater than the law of man. Yeah. And, and the only time that, that the law of man is, is, is something that, that can be followed is whenever it is in harmony with the law of God. And, and I think we're unwilling to do that because it's offensive in our in our culture. It is. You know, it, it's offensive. Well, if I don't believe in God and the law of man's all I've got, what then? Well, it doesn't make God any less real, <laughs> you know. Well, and, and, you know, the church, the church believes that even if you don't believe what we're saying, it's still true. That's exactly you know, right. I mean, it, From you know, the natural like law. Olympia says, you know, my laws do not my beliefs do not require you to believe. Mm -hmm. And the church has an obligation in season and out of season right. to say, yes, contraceptive contraception is bad for you. Right. You know, this this free sex mentality is bad for you, whether you agree with it or not, whether you like it or not, whether it, it strikes with your cord or not. It's still bad for you. And the church needs to be preaching that even if it makes us seem out of date. Yeah. You know, and, and that's something that a lot of Catholics, they're happy to, you know, stand up and scream about, well, I want to have my free rights. But when you say, yeah, but after this, we've also got to stand up with a big poster that says, you know, free sex is bad mm -hmm. yeah. all the time, no matter who you are. Right. You know, it's bad. And then there's a lot less people who are going to be willing to stand up with that banner yeah. after this whole thing is washed over. Yeah, and I mean, you know, lest, lest we, we become people that, that kind of harken back and think that the past was always halcyon, uh, it mm. seems to me that, that in the past, um, just because the church had a voice in society, there once was a time where, where the Catholic Church actually was a voice that was looked to in our own United States as, as a voice that stood for something. Um, the Hollywood even, even witnessed to it, right? There were a whole string of Hollywood movies um, in the 50s and early 60s, that that use the church not as a sounding block for scandal, but as a sounding block for common good. Mm -hmm. You know, and and we've we've lost that I think with the church of individuality, and that's yes. where where everybody becomes their own pope. And and let me tell you, I don't I don't know. It's probably the same for you, Father. It is very difficult to pastor a parish, uh, or two parishes in my case, uh, three in yours, right? Uh, yeah. That uh, that through no fault of their own, have been recipients of, of this very uh, secularized culture that is very individualistic. Because whenever you, you arrive at, at trying to teach someone and say, you know, this is bad for you. Well, what basis do you have? Well, the church teaches that. Well, where does that basis come from? Well, it comes from, from God. 
well, well, where does that basis come from? Well, if nothing <laughs> else, the natural law, rationality, you know, and and people can't can't go in that in that line of of, uh, of logic just because we right. we haven't had it for so long. And I think you're right. We we've sat back by a great deal because we don't want to offend anybody. But you know, I mean, it, yeah. one of the things that I find fascinating is when we were in seminary. And this is right when we were getting ready to leave seminary. We were having what's called a synthesis seminar. Uh, and we, we were sitting down and someone said, uh, you know, we, you should teach people, you know, what some truth, it wasn't a particularly scandalous truth, but it was some truth. And, and one of the students raised his hand and he says, no, 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 that you're depriving them of the right to discover it on their own. If you teach people too much, you know, and, and immediately I raised my hand and, Danger. and I said, Danger. <laughs> when I said, I said, could you, could you ever think of anything less loving and less charitable than depriving someone of the truth? so that they have the ability to discover it on their own. I mean, you know, we could deprive people of the, of the wheel and of fire, you know, and we could let another hundred, hundred billion people die before we discover how to warm ourselves and move stuff from here to there. Or we could take what we know and we could share the truth that Jesus has revealed. Right. You know, and unfortunately the teachers in seminary sided with the other guy, but you know, I mean, the reality is that, that, if we love, and, and Father Chris, you love your parishioners, I even do. if they drive you crazy sometimes, sure. and, and I'm the same way, you know, if you love people, we have a duty and an obligation to say, don't make these mistakes. Right. Yes, adultery seems like it's going to make you feel so good. It's not. Yes, pornography makes it seem like it's going to make you feel so good. It's not. You know, and the same thing with gossip, the same thing with lying, the same thing with, with uh, financial deception, mm -hmm. all those things, all those things, the assumption of the world is as long as you don't get caught, it's fine. Right. But the reality is it's painful and bad for you even while you're enjoying it. Mm -hmm. It's like eating an entire pecan pie. It may be delish, but as in tonight, you know, when you're sitting on the porcelain throne, not so much. <laughs> That's right. You know, the same thing is true with sin. <laughs> That's right. Just like sin, there are always consequences for eating the whole pie. <laughs> There's always a porcelain throne in your future. That's right. <laughs> That's foul and Just like but sin. I'm thinking it's funny. <laughs> It is. <laughs> Father Ryan could write a whole poem based upon his vision of hell. He's <laughs> a limerick. A no, no, we no, no limericks. <laughs> oh, you want me to write an entire poem, like Dante esque poem, based on hell as a uh, as indigestion? Yeah, I think that would be great. I, I I'd read it. it. I have irritable bowel syndrome. So, <laughs> spastic colon. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, so, so we are. We're we're standing up for freedom. Think about how, how you can do that personally. Um, the, the U.S. Bishop's website we'll put in the show notes have, have got uh, a lot of resources for you to make the fortnight uh, day by day through the two-week period. It's already begun, but like a good novena, you can always jump in. And, uh, and also, um, you, you can think about ways that, uh, that maybe you can be a voice in your parish, um, maybe to, to your priest, to your pastor. Um, maybe to someone on the parish staff, maybe to within your own family unit. You know, it's really important we begin to stand up in little ways, um, because I have a feeling, Father, correct me if I'm wrong, that that we will have to stand up in big ways here in the future, um, undoubtedly, and, and be counted, especially in the voting booth. Um, so, um, Fortnite for Freedom, be there or be only one and a half weeks long. Anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, everybody knows. That certain aspects of the liturgy of the church uh, have been out of the limelight for the the past several years, and by several years, I'd probably say about thirty to forty. Um, and, and one of the most edifying liturgies that has fallen by the, the wayside is is the liturgy of the hours. In fact, I was talking with one of our deacons about this. Um, I was installing the Catholic daughters of our state. I'm the the state chaplain for the Catholic daughters of Louisiana, and um, and they wanted to have the installation during the Mass. And it was all written out and everything, and it was part of, uh, of, of what they had done before. And I said, okay, so I did this. And, and as, I was, as I was doing the installation, it took place after the homily. And um, after the Mass, I was talking with the deacon who was assisting me, and I said, you know, this really would have been more appropriate at a celebration of the Psalms, the, the Liturgy of the Hours, um, even, even if it wasn't an official hour, uh, to, to be able to do some sort of paraliturgy where we were able to pray with the church's psalms and pray one of the church's hours and then install these holy daughters as they as they prepared for, for their offices. Um, but it really, it's, it's fallen by the wayside. It, it's one of those things that the Vatican II was very clear about, and yet we haven't really heard a word in our parishes um, unless the priest talks about it. And, of course, if the priest talks about it, nobody knows what he's talking about, you know? <laughs> Divine office? <laughs> Is that on that thing. 
Is that off the highway? How does what is that? <laughs> yeah, so so um we we've picked up on the new liturgical movement blog uh, a really good article on on the cathedral and I've said this for a long time. On the cathedral as the privileged location for the regular celebration of liturgy of the hours. I maintain, Father, that what should happen for every new priest is that his first two or three years should be as a uh, a canon of the cathedral, either official or non-official. And so he begins to learn the community of, pre- of the presbyterate. So maybe you have one senior priest and a few of the younger priests. And their primary job is to, is to either read or chant the office. And then they help with supply help throughout the diocese. That's um, a good idea. I, I think that, I mean, in, in my mind, I would, I would have loved that to have been um, part of my priestly training, even maybe as a deacon, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, uh, you know, it's in, and we just had a, a minor basilica basilified here, you know, a year or two ago. And that's one of the things in the document is that there's supposed to be a regular celebration of the Liturgy of the Hours, sure. even weekly. Yeah. You know, it's just what it is. And, and so, I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you see uh, kind of, um, I mean, we, we know where it comes from, right? It's, it's the ancient monastic practice. Even before that, it was the temple practice of, of reciting the psalmody of, of, of King David, all of the laments, all of the joys, and, and it would be done at certain clock times during the day, huh? at uh, mid-morning, early morning, throughout the day, uh, the evening and night and that sort of thing. And, and it would really kind of keep, keep vigil with God in a sense. It's kind of really a neat idea. And, and the monks preserved it. And uh, the chanting of the hours and the psalms combined with prayers and spiritual reading and things like that. And, and now we as priests and deacons, we're, we're required to do this daily. Even though right. we, we are not a monastic order, it's one of the things that we maintain because whenever the church prays the Liturgy of the Hours, she is officially at prayer. Mm-hmm. And, and we as, uh, as priests, that's a very, uh, a very important uh, part of our, of our presbyterate. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's essential. And it is one of the most difficult parts I've found to be faithful to. Sure. It's well, easy yeah. to get to the end of a long day. You know, and you prayed Liturgy of the Hours, you may have prayed morning prayer at, you know, 7 a.m. or 8 a.m., and you look up, and it's 9.30 at night, and you go, oh, good, I've got four offices left. That's Super right. great. <laughs> um, you know, and that happens more than you'd think. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but it is, it's a beautiful practice, and I find, you know, I discovered this this morning, when you're having, like, your brain is just not turned on, you know, your brain's not in your body yet, Yeah. you know, it's hard to sit down and have a lot of deep meditative prayer, but sure. being able to pull out the Liturgy of the Hours, and I know I'm praying, I'm praying for my people, even if my right. brain is not functioning. Um, and then there are other days where my, I'm very, very tuned in, and every word of that psalm just shoots out at me. Yeah. And uh, I found it to be a, an incredibly important part of, of my priesthood. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was a big revival of the Liturgy of the Hours in the 30s and the 40s. Yeah. Uh, it had fallen into almost complete disuse. In fact, most priests just recited most of the office from memory every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the 30s and 40s, it became a parish thing again. And so Sunday evening, to conclude the Lord's Day, you'd expose the Blessed Sacrament and pray. Uh, it was At that point, there were no four weeks. It was just the same right. Sunday office every Sunday with, with different readings and different prayers. Yeah. Um, and, you, you know, and that was how you, you did things in the 30s and 40s, at least in the U.S. And, uh, and that, of course, is, is no longer the case most of the way around. But, uh, but it is, it's, it's still an option. And, in fact, it's something that could be done remarkably easy. Uh, remarkably yeah. easily in, in a lot of places sure. that have a decent one or two or three voice choir that's willing to come out on Sunday evening, chant the Psalms, you know, put some incense in there, spin around the altar once with the Magnificat, and then put on a nice big cape, say the prayers, give the blessing, and go home. Yeah. It's a cool idea. And, and of course, that, that leads me to to another little uh, tangent that I, 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 would, I just submit for your approval or disapproval. Um, choirs that volunteer versus choirs that are paid. I think mm-hmm. we need a revival of, of volunteer choirs, you know, Absolutely. men and women who, who are willing to say, no, I'm doing this because I love the Lord. <laughs> you know, yeah. I may have a family to feed. I have, may have mouths to feed, but I'm going to run down to my parish and, and I'm going to partake in this, this very important liturgy for the sanctification of my soul and the world. And then I'm going to go back home and I'm going to put the kids to bed. And then, you know, I'm going to have a, a, a pint of Ben and Jerry's or whatever, you know. Uh, but, but, and, and, you know, like you say, Father, yeah. you know, there, there are certain events that we do frequently at mass now. Yeah. Especially in schools. Yeah. Um, where, where it makes no sense at all for us to do this in the midst of mass. But in the Liturgy of the Hours, it makes perfect sense. That's right. You know, a graduation. Um, we, we have a, at, at the school I worked with recently, 
there's a special mass mm-hmm. for everything for senior awards. There's a special mass, and it makes so much more sense to have you know the third graders and the fourth graders and the fifth graders each learn how to chant one of the psalms, right. do three psalms, do a couple of prayers, and then while the priest is wearing his nice fancy cope, you know, but not while mass is taking place. Mm-hmm. Do any number of things you want. You can preach. You can have events. You can have special special things. You know, but don't do them in the context of mass where there's the possibility of profaning the Eucharist. Do it in the context of the liturgy of the hours, which is built right. for this kind of thing. Yeah, that that was always my feeling is is, you know, whenever you make the liturgy a sandwich, the mass a sandwich, basically, you know, mm-hmm. where where the Eucharist is not the core, but it just becomes the other slice of bread on the end. It, it, pun not intended, uh, there, there's, you know, it seems to me that there's something wrong. If, if the cream filling inside the mass is, is uh, senior awards or, you know, uh, who, 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 uh, who has perfect attendance and things like that, that, that is right. a very, uh, it, it begins a slippery slope, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, how would you implement this in your parish? Well, actually when I was at the minor basilica, we had implemented this. Is that and, right? And, and basically, as I said, it works, you know, Sunday evening. Yeah. Um, I, I used the traditional form because it was a lot easier because there was only one week and not four. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, you you chant on a psalm tone. and In the old form, there are five psalms and not three. Uh, but basically, I would wear a cope, come in, chant the, the very first part, and it was very easy. Uh, then everybody would be seated, and the choir would kind of help us out, and we'd do the psalms. And then once the psalms were done, a reader would come up and do the reading. And then if, if I felt like it, I would give a, a short sermonette, you know, two mm-hmm. or three minutes at most. And then we'd, um, you know, just continue with, uh, with some, some intercessions, do the Magnificat, final blessing, and go your merry way. For special events, we might do a, a benediction. But it was super simple. Yeah. And it would take 30 minutes, you know, 25 if, if we were uh, not singing long. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it was in and out, and, but it, it had a deep sense of solemnity to it. And, uh, and the texts are actually very easy to find. You can find the texts of the old Sunday Vespers just by searching for Sunday Vespers on the web. You can contact any priest you want and photocopy, you know, evening prayer too, um, mm-hmm. you know, at, least the, at least the commons from his breviary. And uh, you may have to, to do a little bit of footwork or put together a handout sheet for the readings and prayers and stuff like that week to week. But that's hardly something that would really get in the way of being able to do this in a parish. Yeah. And the cool thing about Liturgy of the Hours is you don't need a priest to preside. It's better, but you don't need one. Mm-hmm. Um, you can have a layperson preside at Liturgy of the Hours, and that's explained very clearly in the book. That's right. And and, and it really could begin a beautiful revival of prayer. And I find it that would. people are, are often looking for that. They want something that connects them to the liturgy. They, they want to be connected to the Mass. Yeah. And this is this and, is the way to do it. These are all of the liturgies that we celebrate other than the Mass point back toward it. And, and, you know, this is the kind of thing, too, that we could take a lot of junk out yeah. of the Mass. Sure. And allow that, you know, in, in each giving each its proper place then allows us to make the Mass much more reverent, much more beautiful. And it allows the Liturgy of the Hours to start to balance the yeah. weight because everything is on the shoulders of Sunday Mass now. Right. And the Liturgy of the Hours allows us to, to balance that weight a lot better. Could be a very beautiful thing. I know that I do the Liturgy of the Hours um, during Advent. Um, we do it on Sunday evening during Advent, and I'll give a little spiritual conference, and we have hot chocolate in the rectory afterwards. Yum. I do look forward to Advent. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but but the people love it. They absolutely love it because it's an opportunity for them to pray together, to be involved in liturgy, because regardless of what people say, they love the liturgy. People love it. We're hard-coded for it. We're hardwired for it. And then to be able to uh, have fellowship afterwards, it's perfect. It's the vertical and the horizontal <laughs> coming together. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Good little helicopter hands there. That's so right. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, so so maybe this is something that you can bring to your parish. Uh, just who am I, Joe or Jane layperson? Yeah, yeah. Start start the dialogue. You might be on the parish council. Start the dialogue. It's important. All righty. Uh, we move uh, to, to one of uh, Father Ryan's favorite bloggers in the National Catholic <laughs> Register. There's a great article listing five questions to ask yourself before you leave the Catholic Church. Now, we know here on the Catholic Underground we're preaching to the choir. You're, you're all quite happy with, with your parishes. You're quite happy with your priest. Um, but, um, but it is worth discussing. Five questions you should ask yourself before you leave the Catholic Church. Father, I'll, I'll let you take it away because I find this very interesting. This is a very uh, a neat kind of conversation to have. 
Yeah, I think it is too. I mean, uh, you know, we we there's a lot of anti-Catholic propaganda and fiction coming out of the media and and popular blogs and and movies. Uh, you know, and and I think all of us are surrounded. I think every one of us is surrounded by former Catholics, sure, who are who are ripe for reversion. Um, you know, and and you know, with low morale and with the the sadness and struggles that comes from economic problems, there's a lot of people who who I think are in a position right now to be drawn back into the faith just by asking a couple of questions. So here are the five questions that Jennifer Fulweiler asks that that each individual who's planning to leave the faith or who has left the faith if they want to be honest with themselves, should be willing to ask and answer. Number one, are you sure members of the church hierarchy, that's bishops and priests, are worse than anyone else? Are you sure members of the church hierarchy are worse than anyone else? Number two, are you sure your faith life would be better outside of the church? That's Hmm. a tough question. Number three, are you sure the church's teachings are wrong? Hmm. Number four, are you sure the church's doctrines aren't divinely inspired? Are you sure the church's doctrines are not divinely inspired? And number five, are you sure that we, meaning the entire human race, don't need the church? (laughs) That's a gigantic question. Are you sure that we don't need the church? That's that's the question that society is asking, uh, especially right now in the midst of this fortnight for freedom and everything. The underlying statement is we don't need the church that's right it's the assumption that's not based on any reality it's simply assumed like all these other things are that we don't need the church you know yeah. the assumption with a lot of people even the church is oh this sex abuse thing and you and you look and say yeah i mean but are you sure these people are worse than anyone else yeah right. statistically you know a priest is whatever the percentage is 0.05 percent you know are going to abuse a child but then you go to your typical elementary school and that number is like five to six percent right you know so it's 40 times higher so right. are you sure you know about all these assumptions we're making that's right and and a lot of times you know um even even outside of of, of the sexual abuse crisis uh, people will leave the church because they don't like the priest or the bishop they they right. have a, a personality a clash or the priest says something. I mean, I don't know about you, but I find myself sometimes walking very much on eggshells trying to figure out how to phrase something so that it can be said, but it won't cause somebody just to cut and run. And mm-hmm. and that's a really sad thing because it, it there, there once was a time, even when I was young, that you wouldn't, you wouldn't assume that the priest or the bishop was saying something to drive you away. Right. You would assume that they were asking the question, even if some of them had personality defects, you would assume that they were asking the question or making the statement out of some genuine desire for your soul. Yeah. And maybe that's just me. Maybe I was, you know, just halo affected everybody. But yeah, are you sure the members of the church hierarchy are worse than anyone else? You know, that, that's a very important question. Are you yeah. sure the church teaching, the church's teachings are wrong? Or, or is it just me personally that has uh, an issue with the church teaching? And that is what's leading me away from the church. Again, this is all positing that that the church is wrong fundamentally, and I'm not. Right. You know? Well, you know, I think the, the two questions that really stood out to me in reading this article are the last two, uh-huh. because they're the two that that most most Catholics right assume are are obvious. You know, are you sure the church's doctrines aren't divinely inspired? And you go to somebody and you go, divinely inspired? <laughs> yeah, right. God has not revealed Himself, and that's the sad. That that's the the definition of despair. Right. When I have become sure that God has not revealed Himself, you know, this is the virtue of faith. Says I I I have the sure and certain trust that God has revealed Himself to us rightly. Right. You know, and so I think there are so many Catholics out there who don't believe in divine inspiration, and they certainly don't believe that the world needs the church. Right. We've gotten into the notion that somehow or another science has led us to the conclusion yeah. that the church and that God Himself are not necessary. Right. And what those people don't realize is that science has not reached that conclusion. No. Scientists have simply said, uh, this makes more sense from my perspective, ergo this is the truth. Right. You know, but but there's no effort to to question it, no effort to ask why. And I think there's a lot of people who are leaving the church in a very dishonest, intellectually speaking way mm-hmm. because they've never even considered asking, is the church necessary? And does the world need the revelation of God, the divine doctrines of the church. Yeah, and that's where we find ourselves is, is people not even believing that the Bible is divinely inspired anymore. And right. if, you, if you can't even get there, 
then there's no way that you can make the leap to saying, well, where did we get the Bible from? Oh, okay, that was the lived tradition of the church. So it's it seems to me that maybe the church is necessary if we got the Bible from it, you know, and we believe the Bible's divine. You, you can't get into that logic if you just go, you know, I don't want to play. I I don't yeah. think we need it. And and it, then that becomes, that's actually just something that happens within our own either disjointed logic or as, as an emotive feeling that we act on. Yeah. You know, it's you not know, really I've, I've never, I've grounded. never talked about it, but I, I had a, a bit of a crisis of faith around my second year of ordination, right around the time you were being ordained a priest father. And, you know, it was, was really torn and I wasn't planning on leaving the church, but I, I was really at a point where I was saying, you know, with all the, the insanity and the, the heterodoxy, you know, wh- what if the SSPX, does that make more sense? Do, mm-hmm. Does one of these these groups, you know, that that just stands up and, and puts the fist down, does that make more sense? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and this went on for about three or four months, and I was really, really torn about it. I remember and, yet. And, uh, you know, I mean, and, and ultimately questions like these were things that kept me from making a bad decision. Yeah. You know, things like, well, whatever, whatever badness may be going on, however much I would rather be in this or that or the other kind of framework or mentality or, in, or society, ultimately I know that Peter or that the Pope is the successor of Peter. Ultimately, I know that the church will be prevented from, from the gates of hell, but I don't know that whatever heterodox society who right. may be holding onto their version of the faith. And, and that was a really tough moment for me. But I mean, in, being intellectually honest meant asking these questions mm-hmm. and it kept me safe from doing something I know and right. everybody around me knows I would regret. Absolutely. And and that's always been my thing is it's, it's, it's always been, even, even when I don't agree with the decision that is made either by my bishop or, or on a, you know, higher up and that sort of thing, even if I don't, even if I struggle with it, I find great comfort in being able to say, "Well, this is the church." Mm-hmm. I, you know, my commitment to her is 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 greater than simply lip service. I I love her, and yeah. and of course, I arrive at at a relationship with God in a different way than you do, Father. You know, um, mm-hmm. per, perhaps you arrive first uh, from the head, in an intellectual sort of way. I don't know. Um, uh, and, and maybe there are some that, that arrive at that relationship from the heart, but either way, it still arrives at the same, the same locus, the same point saying that there is something that is trustworthy here, as you said very well, you, you know, when you ask those questions of yourself, well, at some point you came back to the center saying, but, but this is true. I can't say that it isn't true. Right. You know, and, and, that, and, and I think I, I feel the same thing that the times that I've been tempted to just kind of toss my hands up. Uh, there's always been that uh, that that pervading voice that says no, but you know this to be true. Yeah, <laughs> with all you did, are. Did you ever get a chance to watch that video I sent you with uh, from Father Z's blog? Um, no, I haven't yet. I haven't yet watched it, Father. It's it, it's long. I'll put a link in the show notes. It's almost 17 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, but but there's a there's a group of of nuns and Father Z, of course, in his sardonic way says. Uh, a, a group of protest or protesters confront Father Ted Martin with a really huge rally of about four people uh, <laughs> in front of a church in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and they really picked the wrong priest to go up and confront. They they ambushed him, you know, uh-huh. with a video camera and started asking him a bunch of questions based on bullet points. And this is a guy who is just about to head off to continue work on his STL. Oh, God you know, bless so he's him. super. I mean, and of course he's one of these like you know insanely ridiculous Romel Tolentino smart kind of people. Yeah. And uh, you know, and and they they confront him, and this guy he's got his his stole crossed in front of him, and he very cordially, uh, you know, meets these four women, and one of them is very angry and loud, and for like seventeen minutes they go on trying to blast him, and the whole time he's just looking at them going. Well, you know, the Second Vatican Council in, Cha- uh, in, in Gaudium et Spes, number 22, says this, this, this. And uh, he goes, do you agree with that? And she goes, well, you, you're getting confused. He goes, no, no, you just said this. And the F- Second Vatican Council says the exact opposite. So I'm wondering, <laughs> have you read the Second Vatican Council? And then she goes, oh, well, I've, I've, I've not prepared. I've not studied this. And then not 30 seconds later, she goes, look, I spent 18 years training and all this stuff. And I was, you know, and he, and he goes, well, if you've spent all this time training, why don't you know these things? And uh, it's it's a pretty <laughs> stout video, and 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 thankfully this priest never ever ever loses his cool. He he laughs a lot, yeah. and he's very cordial, but he just body slams these women over and over and over again until finally at the end, you know, they just kind of walk up and go, uh, okay. And but, the lady, 
And and one of the people who uh, who watches her friend get completely smashed mm-hmm. is the one who puts this thing on YouTube. It's crazy, but it's a great video. Yeah, everything I need to know uh, happens in the first second of the video. The first second of the video, the title caption is in Comic Sans. Yeah, <laughs> that's all you needed to know. <laughs> and actually, I'm looking at a uh, here's a uh, an update on that that post, and we'll put it in the in the show notes. It says the lady, Kim Frankie, who is the obnoxious woman who confronts him, mm-hmm. is a former sister of mercy uh, with two theology degrees, including a master's degree from Notre Dame, mm. where she studied with Richard McBrien mm. and then taught theology at the collegiate level. And although, quote, Catholic to the core, quote, and unwilling to give up on the church, her love-hate relationship with the institution makes it too difficult for her to attend mass since women are not, quote, fully incorporated into the liturgy. And so she's part of a home church with a dozen friends who meet weekly, share homilies on the readings, and then uh, support and participate in various local ministries. So she doesn't actually go to Mass. Let's, let's dial back. Are you sure the church's teachings are wrong? Are you sure your faith life would be better outside the church? Are you sure the church's doctrines aren't divinely inspired? Are you sure we don't need the church? Those are the questions that, that, this ha- that have to be asked here, you know? God bless her. I'll keep her in prayer, you know, because I just, not to get off on another uh, tangent, but but the, the notion of um, of the, the LCSW, the, the group of, of, of religious sisters meeting with Rome and, and being unhappy with a lot of the discussions and things like that, th- this is all part and parcel to these questions that have to be asked, and, and we really have to be willing to say, okay, and, and this, I realize I'm a man saying this, I'm a priest who's saying this, but but... It's, it's got to go beyond gender issues. It's got to go beyond this at some point and say, is the Lord intending an institution, a divinely inspired institution for the good of your soul? You know, it's the whole thing that we celebrated with uh, the birth of John the Baptist today. He, he wasn't just sending people down into the water. He was preparing them. He was preparing them for Jesus to come to bring us salvation in baptism and to bring us a church that would make sure that we could arrive safe and happy with our seat backs and tray tabled, stowed properly in heaven. You know? And I just, it, it's crazy that we can't, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is the presence of sin in our world, you know. But, uh, but we continue to pray um, for, for all of the hearts who struggle and for all of the hearts who seek and seek earnestly for the truth. And that's, that's a good thing. It's a very worthy thing. All right, finally. Finally, in the podcast, um, uh, by way of, of, of chattiness, um, the Catholic Press Association's Catholic Media Conference happened last week in Indiana. Don't forget to pray constantly for these kinds of events. Uh, more and more are popping up. Even though uh, Catholicon did not happen this year, um, we remain supportive and prayerful of all of these events. That includes the Catholic New Media Celebration. Uh, anything where, where we're seeking to, to bring faith to the digital continent, um, we, we ask that the Holy Spirit come. You know, because the Holy Spirit can use all of us, and uh, even if there is no Catholicon this year, we will support those that those that are doing well and, and following what the Church is asking, and going out into uh, this uh, this digital continent, this new evangelization field. So, um, what we're going to do now is uh, is take a little bit uh, of of time to uh, express to you our picks of the week. <laughs> Alrighty, that's uh, that's the pick of the week music, so you know it's important. Uh, <laughs> Father Ryan, you you've just gotten off a giant boat um, and a plane and another plane, and so and I'll let you train and, and a tram and a train and a tram and and uh, one of those catamaran things and a and a gondola. Uh, what what's your pick of the week? Well, actually, I'm going to give you two because I've been away and I actually I have a, a list of about thirteen, but I'm just going to give you two today. Oh, okay. Uh, one is the social network called goodreads.com. It started out as just a little website and has evolved into a full, fully functioning social network based around what books you're reading. Um, my favorite contributor to this network by a mile is uh, the Kurt Jester, Jeff Miller, who, uh, who reads voraciously and has great reviews. Um, but what you do is you, you rate books you've read and you kind of update people as to how far you are through whatever books you're reading. And it gives you recommendations that are spooky good. Really? Uh, like about accurate. What you, I mean, insane. Like, I, you know, I've, 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 I've maybe rated 
75 books, you know, or so, hmm. um, out of probably two or 300 that I intend to rate at some point. And it's insane how accurate the books it's recommending are. I mean, even to down to the point of recommending a book by a guy named Vogelin, um, that I've been looking and thinking about reading myself for months. Vogelin hasn't written anything in 30 years. He was a professor at LSU who hmm. wrote about political theory. It's astounding. I mean, really, wow. really good. Uh, and also, it's fun. You have you can have iPhone, iPad access, Facebook access to Goodreads. Uh, you know, tell people what you're reading and what you're enjoying. It's it's very cool. It's very free, and uh, it's it's gotten a lot better in the last six months. And so, I certainly recommend people who are readers go to Goodreads.com. And the other thing I want to recommend has no website, and it's not a particular thing. It's just the idea of a hop on, hop off bus, um, <laughs> like in Camdy. <laughs> no, I'm thinking of the ones in Rome and Barcelona that I was yeah. on. Um, but Father Chris, you know your 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 family when when people are tired of walking, yeah, um, and you oh, want to see you want to see a lot of a city. You know, you go around and and hey, if something looks interesting, you hop off, you take some pictures, you hop back on. It beats the heck out of paying a lot for a tour, yeah, uh, and it also beats the heck out of of trying to to put it together yourself. These yeah. these tours know the big sites, they take you on the scenic routes, and uh, I. I it's the first time I've experienced them, and they are awesome. And so if you're vacationing or you're out of town, I recommend strongly you try the hop-on, hop-off buses. Um, they're very, very cool. I did the one in Barcelona and the one in Rome that was yellow. and uh, The Christian like, Tours one there. Yeah, yeah. And, and very, very good experience all around. So it's uh, if you've had experiences, email us. But uh, I, I'm really excited about the hop-on, hop-off bus. Yeah, and I think it was uh, it was fairly inexpensive. It was like 35 euro. It wasn't, it wasn't anything huge, huh? Yeah, my, the, well, the one for my family was uh, 19 euro a day. Yeah, see, perfect. Yeah, exactly. And and that's the best way to see it. And you try and plug your headphones into those uh, <laughs> poorly translated yeah. things. <laughs> but well, we, still. Had, we had the computer person who kept saying, and now going down to the Coliseum. <laughs> <laughs> Coliseum. Great. Couldn't get a real American to talk here. It's only 45 minutes. <laughs> My my pick of the week, actually, I, because we're in, in new studios that are constantly changing, in fact, we'll probably be changing the backdrop yet again as we move farther to the back of the studio, uh, closer to the production room, so I don't have my, um, my my setup to show you my iPhone screen, but but my pick of the week is actually the updated This Week in Tech app. Um, if, you, if you're uh, familiar with the Twit Network, it's Leo Laporte and all of his um, merry minstrels that, uh, that have shows on the network. And uh, it's really neat. I don't know if I can hold it up to the screen for you to see it. It is a retina display, but, you know, um, they, they've got a much better um, a much better interface here. You can switch from audio to video. So say you want to listen to the audio feed, you can just uh, slide the slider over to audio. They tell you what's presently playing, whether it's reruns or whether it's a live show. If you slide the slider over to video, automatically the video comes up and starts playing whatever's on the air. Um, it really... It's what I think that uh, that a, a Catholic new media app should also be. It's from the folks at Shift Key, Shift Key Software. Uh, I believe that it's available free in the App Store, and uh, I'm not certain if it's got an iPad app uh, with it. It also has AirPlay built in, so you can do the AirPlay from right there in the app too, which is really neat. So uh, it's it's the new This Week in Tech. It's the Twit app. Um, and, uh, and again, this is for those of you who are who are techno geeks like us that uh, like to keep up with what's going on, um, whether it's uh, it's about um, tech news or any number of other things that the Twit Network has. So that's my pick of the week um, for Very for cool. this week. Yep. All righty. Um, uh, we'd like to thank. Uh, do we do we have an audible plug this week? We can have a plug. We don't have a pick. We don't have we a pick, but, but a we certainly want to thank Audible.com uh, for their sponsorship of the Catholic Underground because you're actually helping us out whenever you go to audibletrial.com. Audible is the world's leading supplier of audiobooks in the spoken word for digital audio. If you surf over to audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground, you're going to get a 14-day trial membership and a free book download, and you can cancel any time, and you still get to keep the book. Membership offers you one or two uh, audiobooks every month and gives you access to tons of free and discounted materials. So that includes books and magazines and even daily newspapers like the Wall Street Journal and, uh, and the New York Times. Don't let your time behind the wheel or at the stove or at the gym be wasted. Um, this week we don't have a recommendation, but if you go in the show notes from our past episodes, you've probably missed one, especially one of Josh's. I was just making fun of him today. Um, uh, so, so go check out audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. Get your free book. For, and, and then you can help us out, too, because we get a little bit of the monies 
uh, for when you sign up for the free trial. Okay. All right. Uh, that's it for us this week. If you want links and show notes that we mentioned in the show and you want to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and all that stuff, visit us at catholicunderground.com. That's the way to do it. You're also going to find all of our new media projects that way. Um, and if you want to make yourself heard, you can also chime in uh, in the comment section. Father Ryan's church is online at campdcatholicchurch.com. Father Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. I think we've had a, a wonderful episode. I think so, too. It's been a great time. It's good to see you again. I'm glad to be back from vacay, and I will see you all again as soon as I can. Yes, indeed. And, uh, and of course, you know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. You can catch me online uh, at, uh, at probablynotprofound.com, which is my blog that I try to update. You can also catch me on Twitter. I'm at Digital Catholic. Yep. Thanks for hanging around and joining us on this digital continent. It's CatholicUnderground.com, and we're Faith Gone Digital. See you next time.